So what's the purpose of having a, a cup, an empty cup? The purpose of having a cup is so that it's filled with some type of liquid enjoyment. All right? You don't leave a cup on your, on your counter for one, two, three, four days empty. The purpose of having a cup is so that you can fill it. In fact, if, if it's empty, you usually put it, in your, put it in your cupboard. A cup is needed for us because we, by nature, are thirsty. And so we have to ask the question, what really can quench the thirst that we have? What, what can quench our thirst? Now, I'm going to show you a picture. Try not to get too thirsty here. Okay, here we go on the screen. All right. What is that? Sprite. Do you know what Sprite's slogan is? What is it? Obey your thirst. All right. Obey your thirst. Why do they pick that slogan? They pick that slogan because they are, they're literally telling, telling us, look, your thirst is commanding you. Feed me, feed me, feed me. And so what do, we, what, what do we do? The first thing that we should do is get their product Sprite and drink it down to quench our thirst. I hate to uh, tell you, and I hate to burst your bubble, Sprite is not going to really quench your deepest thirst. Neither is the eggnog that you might drink this Christmas season. There's only one thing, I'm going to give you, there's only one thing that can quench the deepest thirsts of our heart. And it's in that song that we sing. Let's sing it one more time. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Fill me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. So there's a clue. Let's pray. Father, we want our cups filled. We don't want to go around life this Christmas season, life in 2018, without our cups filled. And so please, teach us today how we can have, have our cups filled and our thirst quenched. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, a familiar story. John chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Verse 4, but he needed to go through a place called Samaria. So here was Jesus with his disciples. He's in Judea to the south, and he wanted to go back to his hometown in Galilee, but he had to pass through this region called Samaria in between. And as he's traveling, we learn in verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Verse 6, now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So you can imagine, put yourself in Christ's sandals. Here you are, you're walking. It's about noon. The sun is scorching. It's, 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 it's in the middle of the day. There's sweat dripping from Christ's face. And all of a sudden, someone comes into the picture. Verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to drink, to draw water. And what did Jesus say to her? Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Did you catch what this woman said? She said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Two issues here. She's a Samaritan and she's a woman, but what's going on with these, who are these Samaritans? The Samaritans were a, a mixed group of people whom Esarhaddon, he was an Assyrian king, 
settled in cities of Samaria. So they had no choice. They were just placed here by this, this king. These people mixed with the Jews who were still in the land and gradually abandoned their idolatry and adopted parts of the Jewish religion. So they kept some of their, their pagan teachings and, 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 and beliefs, and they adopted some of the Jewish religion, Jewish teachings. When the Jews returned from their captivity, the Jews in Jerusalem refused to allow the Samaritans to take part in rebuilding the temple. So here were all the Jews. Hey, let's go build the temple. And then the Samaritans came, came uh, and knocked on door door. Hey, can we help you? Can we help you uh, build the temple? They said, no, go back home. And thus this fueled hatred between them. They built a rival temple then in Mount Gerizim, which was, however, destroyed by a Jewish king. Add more fuel to the fire. So they built another one in Shechem. There was bitter hatred between the Jews and Samaritans. There's a scholar by the name of D.A. Carson. He writes in his commentary on the book of John. He says this, Although some Jews could imagine eating with Samaritans, doubtless many a Jew would not eat with a Samaritan on the latter's home turf for fear of incurring ritual defilement. So a Samaritan might invite a Jew, hey, you come over to our house. But a Jew wouldn't come over, go over to, some, to, the, to the Samaritan's home because he, didn't, he or she did not want to become ritually defiled. I don't want to become dirty, so I'm not going to associate and eat at a Samaritan's home. So imagine being a Samaritan during those days. How would you feel? I wouldn't feel very happy. I'd feel like an outsider. I'd feel like, hey, I want to be part of the inside group. But these people, no, they, they don't care for me. I'm an outsider. Come on, guys. You know, you know, you know what an outsider feels like. Some of you have felt this. So it's, it's the first day of school. You're there in the cafeteria line. And you're hoping that that cafeteria line will go at least, you'll be in the line for about at least 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes because you don't have any friends. You don't know anyone. And uh, so you finally get your food, and you're dragged, and you watch, and you look at all the tables, and you see, hmm, do I know anyone? No, nah, I don't know that person. I don't know these people. Because, uh, so those are a group of friends over there. And so you don't know where to sit. So what do you do? Then you, you go to the, uh, uh, you go get some juice. You keep looking. No one's there. Hmm, where do I go next? So then you go all the way to the other side of the cafeteria, and you grab a piece of bread, and you make toast while you're trying to figure out, who am I going to sit with? But you have no friends. And so what do you do? You sit at a table all by yourself, outsider. And guys, students, you're not the only ones who feel that way. Us adults, we feel that way. We're just good at hiding our, our, uh, our fear. An outsider. Some of you have experienced being bullied by people. You have become the target of jokes. Outsider. These, Samaria, these Samaritans, they were frowned upon, jeered at, mocked, considered outcasts, dirty. Yet, Jesus still had the audacity to talk to this stranger from Samaria. Why is that? We'll put it on the screen. Because Jesus respects outsiders. You know what happened just four months ago, August of this year? How many of you heard of the story of Charlottesville? In North Carolina. LA Times wrote this, the clashes that broke out over the weekend at a white national rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, have become a new touchstone in the nation's long-running debate over racism, free speech, and violence. One woman was killed, and you heard that story, and many more were injured when a car allegedly driven by a rally participant sped into a crowd of anti-racism protesters. Time magazine, in, the, uh, in the, their ideas section, was this man by the name of Doug Stafford wrote this at the end of his article about Charlottesville. Please listen. I'm white and live in a wealthy suburb of Washington, D.C. My daughter, who is five years old, is black. Last month, some coward in a truck driving quickly by us, not far from our home, screamed nigger at her. And then he says sarcastically, so please try to tell me racism is dead, or at least that you'd like to keep your monument standing and your torches lit. Please tell us more about the moral equivalence between the racists and the people enraged by them. And then he says, you can't, because racism isn't dead. 
We cannot pretend it is. Instead, we have to acknowledge it, then join together to eradicate it once and for all. People in our country who are oppressed. One month later, in the month of September, hashtag, take a knee. National Football League, you heard about it. Guys, you saw it. All these guys, they took a knee. Why did all of these football players this past September take a knee? Where did it start from? Well, you've heard the story of Colin Kaepernick, NFL player. All the NFL players who took a knee during the national anthem followed, in his, by, uh, by, followed his example. Huffington Post, written by Lily Workney, September 2017. She says this, Racism is why Kaepernick knelt during the, anthem, during the anthem. Racism is why police violence continues to disproportionately take the lives of countless black men and women. A reason Kaepernick specifically gave for why he, protest, he protested to begin with. Guys, I am by no means making a political statement. I, whether or not you agree with them taking a knee, that's besides the point. What is the source of that? That's what I'm trying to get at. She continues, no, she quotes Kaepernick. I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color, Kaepernick told NFL last year. At least 223 black Americans have been killed by police since Kaepernick first knelt in August 2016. He says this, to me, this is bigger than football and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way, he said. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. And Lily finishes, racism is why oppression in America continues to function, creating a societal hierarchy that places black people at the bottom. Racism is why discrimination exists and why black lives matter must be said. So I asked the question to us here, our church family, have you ever felt the sting of racism? Maybe you've, you know someone who has felt the sting of racism. You know, we have students here at Campion Academy, at our elementary school at HMS, church members of all different backgrounds. We have Hispanics, people who are Latino, white, black, Asian. We have people here from the Congo, people from Japan, from China, from Indonesia. Perhaps some of you have heard those stinging racist remarks from bigoted lips and you feel like an outsider. I want to tell you today that Jesus respects outsiders. I mean, we learn here in verse 9, look, look, what, look what this woman said. How is, it that, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, an outsider? For Jews, no, Jews have no dealings with outsiders like me. You know, Jesus apparently had two strikes against him. Number one, the woman, this, this, this woman was a Samaritan. Number one, but number two, the person that Jesus was talking to was a woman. You know, during their time, wo women were undervalued in Jewish culture. D.A. Carson, that, that evangelical scholar, writes in his commentary, he says this, probably this fear was intensified when the Samaritan was a woman. Within a generation, Jewish leaders would codify a law. They would enact a law that reflected long-standing popular sentiment to the effect that all the daughters of the Samaritans are menstruants from their cradle and therefore perpetually in a state of ceremonial uncleanness. I can't believe that they would actually codify that kind of law back then. But what about today in today's culture? You know, unfortunately, all we see on the news lately is that women are undervalued in our culture too. Guys, there's a hashtag that's going viral that started actually just a few months ago. Hashtag Me Too. Have you guys heard of it? Hashtag Me Too spread virally as a two-word hashtag used on social media on October 2017, just two months ago, to denounce sexual assault and harassment in the wake of sexual misconduct allegations against film producer and executive Harvey Weinstein. The phrase, long used in this sense by social activist Tarana Burke, was popularized by actress Alyssa Milano, who encouraged women to tweet it to publicize experiences to demonstrate the widespread nature of misogynistic behavior. Since then, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of people have used the hashtag to come forward with their experiences, including many celebrities. Milano says this, 
She tweets, if all the women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote me too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. The phrase had been used more than 200,000 200, times by October 15 and tweeted more than 500,000 times by October 16 in one day. On Facebook, the hashtag had been used by more than 4.7 million people in 12 million, 12 million posts during the first 24 hours. In addition to Hollywood, Me Too declarations call elicited discussion of sexual harassment and abuse in the music industry, the sciences, academia, and politics. I want to speak to the ladies in this congregation, in this room. I want to tell you that in this culture where you may be treated like objects, Jesus reminds you that you are not an object. In fact, Jesus is willing to sit down to have a conversation and to talk with you. You know why? We'll put it on the screen. Jesus respects women. You know what he says to you? He says, young woman, lady, you are my child. I created you. I love you. You are worth more than gold in my eyes. A few years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of, of uh, going to a school, an academy, to speak. And when we were, we were in uh, a room, we opened up After uh, about two or three days of speaking, I opened up an opportunity for students to talk to us. One young lady came in there, and she shared, she shared with her how she was mistreated. And I won't go into detail, but you could, obviously she was hurt, not just physically, but mentally and psychologically. And what I noticed there is that this lady, this young lady, just wanted to be heard, and the best that we could do for her is not only here, but to offer her hope to offer her hope that this Jesus respects you, that this Jesus loves you. And as we told this to this young lady, she, her, eyes, uh, her eyes were wide, joy, tears streaming from her face with joy because she knew that she was respected by one who created her and, that, and who loves her. Jesus respects women. He, is, he respects the oppressed. And look, if you've been hurt, We have counselors in our congregation. We can connect you with people. If you've been hurt, talk to me. Talk to Pastor Ezekiel. Talk to someone on our pastoral, pastoral staff. We're here for you. Jesus respects the oppressed. But not only does Jesus respect the oppressed, he satisfies our deepest longings. In fact, he offers us three steps to true and lasting fulfillment in life. Number one is see better water. Put it on the screen. See better water. I'm going to ask my friend Logan to come forward. Thank you so much. Does that water look good? Yeah, it looks awesome. Good. I'm glad you said that. See better water. Verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There's that key word. Check out verse 11. So the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do we get that living water? Verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Verse 13. Listen to the words of Christ. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of this water will what? Will thirst again. Jesus Christ was pinpoint accurate about our human dilemma. Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. We drink from worldly wells or we even drink from decent wells, but we're never really satisfied. But what happens? We keep going back to the same well over and over and over again, satisfied for a moment, but it doesn't last. And this devastating cycle leaves us empty. You know, King Solomon knew about this emptiness. He said this, I understood great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. 
I amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I remember one evangelist saying that the problem with our nation is not the problem of pain. It's the, prob it's the problem of pleasure because it leaves us empty. And Solomon knew this because he said this in verses 17 and 20. He said, because of all this pleasure, I hated life. My heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. There was a singer by the name of Peggy Lee. This, she's written about in Tim Keller's book, Making Sense of God, page 81. He says this, in 1969, the singer Peggy Lee recorded the song, Is That All There Is? We'll put that line on the screen. Is That All There Is? Written by Jerry Leiber and Mike Stroller. The woman speaking in the song tells about being taken as a 12-year-old to the circus that was called The Greatest Show on Earth. But as she watched, she had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what, but when it was over, I said to myself, Is that, there, is that all there is to a circus? Later, she says that she fell so very much in love with the most wonderful boy in the world. I mean, you can imagine the hair being tossed, the most wonderful boy in the world. And then one day, he left her, and she, she thought she would die. But I didn't, and when I didn't, I said to myself, is that all there is to love? At every turn, everything that should have delighted and satisfied her did not. Nothing was big enough to fill her expectations or desires. There was always something missing, though she never knew what it was. Everything left her asking, is that it? Is that it? So every stanza of her, every stanza of her life, like her song, went back to the same refrain. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? It's, if that's all there is, my friends, let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. You see... Worldly waters will never satisfy our heart. And not only will worldly waters not only satisfy our heart, people will never satisfy our hearts to the fullest extent. Come on, ladies, students. You know, there's a difference between, there's a difference between love and infatuation. Do you know the difference between love and infatuation? What's the difference between the two? This is what infatuation looks like. Infatuation looks like this. A boy comes into your world. You start a conversation. Ooh, hey, I think he likes me. And so you start feeling some electricity. And so you take that electricity and you start texting every two hours. You sit in the classroom. Come on, teachers. You don't see, but you know what's happening. Hey. Let me check my text message while, while uh, they're waxing eloquent about algebra. All right, electricity. Just go to sleep at night. Got to send a text to him. Electricity. First thing you want to do when they wake up in the morning is not even drink water. They pull out their phone. We pull out our phone. Hey, electricity. And so what happens when this boy, let's, what, what happens when this girl becomes your world? and you lose him, he breaks your heart, or she breaks your heart, what happens to your world? You no longer have a world because your world was wrapped up in that person. And so you wait for the next person to come around to, fulfill, to fill that vacancy in your heart. I want to tell you that people will never satisfy your deepest longings. What about busyness? Will busyness ever fulfill our deepest longings? Guys, I'm a parent. My baby probably woke me, kept me up two or three times last night, crying, busy. And some of you, all right, wake them up at 6, prepare their breakfast at 6.30, bring them to school at 7.30. All right, after that, go to King Supers, go to the grocery store, bring the groceries back, go in the house, start cooking. But, oh, wait, I forgot to get the groceries. So you go back into the trunk, get the groceries. And then once the groceries are there, you don't have any help. So you have to actually unpack and put the groceries in the, the, grocery, in the refrigerator and in the cupboard. And then finally you can cook. But then you realize that, uh, John, that uh, Lisa and, and little, little John, 
they, they don't have clothes for tomorrow. So you have to do laundry. So you start the laundry load, and then uh, while the laundry is going, you totally forget that you have to leave in 10 minutes to pick up the kids at school. You pick up the kids at school. Then you put the laundry that's wet into the dryer, and then you feed the, the, the kids supper. You make sure that they're playing, they're, playing, uh, they're, 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 they're doing their homework and, and, play, and, and uh, practicing their music. That's right, that's right. Practicing their music. Amen from our music conductor here. And then finally, guys, it's time to sleep. Nonstop. Busyness never satisfies. Or maybe you're at that age of life where you're just, you're retired and you, you take a step back, and not, but it's Christmas time. And so you have all your Christmas cards there on your table and you've got to send them out, but you don't even have stamps yet and you have to do that this week. And then you have to put a menu together for, for, uh, for all the family that's coming, but you've got to make sure that you have the right amount of family. You know that who's coming to your house for Christmas. And then you prepare all this and you keep yourself busy. But busyness does not satisfy. And Jesus reveals to this Samaritan woman that there's something better than the water that she is tasting. Because he says this, pick it up in verse 13 again. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. This temporary water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So what's Christ saying here? Look, if you drink my living water, my pure, clear, and clean living water, you will never be thirsty again. You will be completely satisfied and fulfilled. You will find what your heart has always been looking for. It's as if John reaches back a few hundred years to the prophet Isaiah, and he pulls out these words in Isaiah chapter 55. We'll put it on the screen. Every, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who will have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Why do we spend our money on things that don't satisfy, friends? That's what he's saying. Listen carefully to me, God is saying to us, and, and eat what is good. And notice this line. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The waters that you will drink will spring up everlasting life, and you will be able to taste that forever and ever and ever and ever. There are deep and lasting and utterly satisfying pleasures and delight when we drink from the fountain of life. Step number one, you've got to see that there is actually better water than the water that you're drinking. Maybe you've come to the place where you're just empty. Your cup is empty. There's better water out there. There is living water. So what does that look like? How can I see that there's something better? Every time you see Christ, every time you, you read, you open the Bible and you pray, anytime you join a small group Bible study, anytime you come to church and you, and you, you hear about Christ and you see people who have been changed by Christ, can I see a raise of hands of people who can testify that you have tasted the living water and that you are finding true joy in the living water? Can I see a raise of hands? When you come to church, you see people who are satisfied in the fountain of life, satisfied in the water of life. You see that there's actually better water than you're actually drinking. Step number one, see better water. Step number two, discard dirty water. Logan, bring it up. I asked Logan, would you actually drink, and it's gross, would you actually drink this water? He said, hey, God made dirt, and what'd you say? And dirt won't hurt. Man, I don't want you to drink this in my eyes. I don't want to get in trouble. Step number one, see better water. Step number two, discard dirty water. Let's pick it up in verse 15, John 4, verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Verse 16, and Jesus said to her, it's, it's amazing how, how Jesus even said that. He said, go, call your husband and come here. Why did he bring up her husband? Notice verse 17. The woman answered and said, almost sheepishly, I have no husband. 
Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Verse 19. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Do you notice how she tried to parry Christ's penetrating focus on her life? Now, we don't know exactly why this woman, this Samaritan woman had five husbands, and now she had a new man in her life, but it is very obvious that Jesus probed a sensitive area in her life. You know, it's striking to see how Christ would often drive to a person's greatest sin, hopelessness, guilt, despair, and need. And so we see here that Jesus struck a nerve in this, this uh, Samaritan woman's soul. She tried to parry any further, further probing about this sensitive area in her life. She tried to mask her guilt. She tried to mask her hurt. Is there someone here this morning who has a shameful past? Something that, you, that you've experienced, something that has been done to you, maybe you, had, you really had no choice. Maybe, maybe you've been hurt. Maybe there's some shame in your life, whether it's an action or even, even the, way, the way that you have been speaking to people. Maybe you're a character. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ, he knows our dirty pasts. He knows it. He knows our pain. He knows our moral breakdown. He knows our struggle. He knows our regrets. And you know the reason why he shines his light on our dark past and he reveals that we have dirty water? The reason why he shines his bright light on our dark past is so that we can throw away and discard the dirty water to have the better water instead. So step number two, discard dirty water. What does that look like? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. Is that what the scripture says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for all of our sins, to cleanse us from all of unrighteousness. So we come to Christ and we say, God, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I repent. I turn away. I no longer want this dirty water. I want better water. Step number one, see that there's better water, living water. Step number two, Throw, that, throw away that dirty water. Last but not least, step number three, taste the living water. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. The Samaritan woman abruptly switches the conversation from her life to a theological contention. What was the problem here? You see, the Jews believed that Jerusalem was the true place of worship. The Samaritans, though, on the other hand, they believed that Mar Gerizim was the true place of worship. Both Jews and Samaritans were looking to a shrine, to a location. But notice what Jesus says in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. And by the way, when he says woman, it's not a derogatory term. It's actually a term, a term of endearment, a term of respect. It would be kind of like madame, madame. Believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. What were those two things? Spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him, verse 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship in the Samaritan and the Jewish economy was based on a location. We got to go to the location. We need to go to the mountain. We need to go to the temple. That's where I'm going to truly worship. But since Christ came on the scene, he says, no, 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 no. It's not, your worship is not based on location alone. It's now based, it's now, it now flows from the spirit, number one, and truth, number two. So the natural question is, what does it mean to worship in spirit 
and truth. Well, first, let's talk about spirit. Jesus, what do you mean that now we worship in the spirit? Let me give you a clue. John 6, verse 63 on the screen. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. You know, in John chapter 3, we learn there's a, a man by the name of Nicodemus, this ruler of high standing, of high rank. And he comes to Jesus by night, says, you're a teacher. And to make a long story short, Jesus says, look, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And he's like, come on, seriously? You want me to jump back into my mother's womb and be born again? That's impossible. And he says, when Jesus told him, most assuredly I say to you, unless you are born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That means that the entrance into the kingdom is not based on the location you worship. So you might be coming to church thinking, okay, I'll be saved, I'll, I'll be safe, and I'll be saved. I'll come and worship at a location at church. But that doesn't work that way. What Jesus is saying is that the Spirit of God now moves in the life and the heart of someone, changes their taste buds where they know, where they, they didn't really have a... Uh, um, uh, a taste for spiritual things. Now they, could, they, they can't wait to devour spiritual things. The Spirit of God comes into the life, and the Spirit of God moves the heart, changes the taste buds, and now gives the individual, the person, a desire for spiritual things, a desire for Jesus, a desire for heaven, a desire for God, a desire to live with the angels, a desire to bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and, and to say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to, 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 who deserves all honor and glory and power. That's what it means to worship in spirit. The spirit comes into the life and changes your taste buds. So that's spirit. But Jesus, what did you mean then to worship in spirit and then truth? What does it mean to worship in truth? And I know that many here, including myself, think, all right, truth, proposition, facts, doctrines, orthodoxy. But I want to point your attention to what Jesus said. Pastor Phil quoted this in our Sabbath school class. John 14, 6, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is truth? Do you notice what Jesus does here? Please listen. Jesus changes the main category of truth from proposition to person. Let me say that again. Jesus changes the main category of truth, the way that we come to God, the way that we know truth, from proposition to the person of Christ. So what does that look like? Two groups. One, I am aware and I, I, and I, I would not be surprised if we even see in our institutions people Students who doubt the existence of God. In fact, there are some who may even say, I am an agnostic, I don't know if there is a God, or I'm an, athe I'm an atheist. Maybe you've done research and you've found, according to your reason, that there is no God. But here's my challenge to you who may be in the valley of decision. First, give God a chance, number one. But secondly, evidence and proposition and teaching and fact alone will not lead you to God. The person of Jesus Christ will lead you to God. The person, which implies that we need, that I need to have a relationship with this Savior. And so here's my challenge. Instead of pushing back and saying, look, you, you Christian, you believers don't have, you have no, look, you're, you're all faith, you're no reason, I'm all, re I'm all reason and you're, there's no faith. No, it doesn't work that way. My challenge to you is, hey, Go on your knees and just say, God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show yourself to me? And the first thing that I believe he will tell you is, look, you want to know me? You really want to know me? Have a relationship with the person of Christ. First group, second group. It pains me. It pains me when, I, when we hear, when I hear from other believers, hey, I was, tell me about your experience with God. Hmm, all right. You know, I had a good, job. I had a good time defending this doctrine and, 
and uh, man, I, I, was, I studied John chapter, John chapter 5, and then at First Peter, this really hard text that I didn't really understand. I studied it, and I taught it, and, their whole, and I'm not saying that this is wrong, guys, but I'm saying that their whole world is wrapped up in orthodoxy. And when you ask, hey, in what way did you actually enjoy the person of Christ this week? The answer you, you hear is, well, uh, I stood up for this truth, and um, this, is, uh, this is the way it is. And, I and guys, I'm not saying that we get rid of doctrine and proposition. But my challenge to those who might be propositionally bent would be, when was the last time that you actually sat at the feet of Jesus and enjoyed, delighted, and found your greatest, greatest pleasure in his actual presence? When was the last time that you actually enjoyed communion, com talking to God? I, I know people. Hey, tell me about your devotional life. Oh, yeah, I, I go half an hour, 45 minutes, and I read scripture in my devotional book, and then I add a cherry on top. I pray. And I say, no wonder you're struggling in life. Because the soul, the mind, the mind is engaged, but the heart is still hard. It hasn't been broken. And you still haven't found your truest joy in the person of Christ. True worshipers, Jesus says, will worship in spirit and in truth. And guys, I don't taste the living waters in this location at church alone, and trust me, I come to church for a blessing, and I always get a blessing at this church. And I know you do as well. That's why you come. But I don't taste. We don't taste the living waters in this location at church alone. I taste. We can taste the living waters every time the Spirit leads me to the Savior and worship. And that can happen in your closet. That can happen in your bedroom. When the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning is not run and uh, check your email. But you check yourself and you say, hey, let me get on my knees and bow before my maker, the one who created me. And when you come to that God in worship, what Ellen White says is so true in Desire of, Desire of Ages, page 187. We'll put it on the screen. He who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to thirst again. Everywhere, men and women are unsatisfied. They long for something to supply the need of the soul. And then she says, only one can meet that need, that want. The need of the world, the desire of all nations is, say it with me, is Christ. Every time I bow and worship before my Savior, my soul is completely and fully satisfied. And so what good is it? Step number one, to see that there is better water. What good is it to discard dirty water if we don't come to step number three and actually taste the living water? And guys, that felt good because I've been talking a lot. Taste the living water. So the woman of Samaritan, the, the woman of Samaria was so excited she told everyone about. She told everyone in town, hey, come meet a man who knew about my life. Pick it up in verse 39, John 4, 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And please don't miss this verse. We'll put it on the screen. Verse 41, and many more believed because of what? Because of his own word. So my question for you is this. What is your primary, what is the way that you taste Christ? Is it from what the preacher says or what, what uh, Chaplain Ezekiel says or what someone else says in a devotional thought? Are you getting secondhand information? Many more people in Samaria, many people believed in Christ because of the Samaritan woman. But many more people believe because they went to the actual source. So guys, don't let someone else drink the living water for you. Drink it for yourself. Psalm 34, verse 8. Here's my challenge. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And guys, truly, I can speak from experience. There's nothing sweeter than drink, drinking the living water of Jesus Christ. 
You can't produce eternal joy and salvation in your soul. You might try. You might try to go out of your way to do something in order to work out your eternal life and to somehow create this living water experience in your life. But the reality is that you can't. Only Jesus can. And he says, look, don't work your whole life trying to gain that living water. All you have to do is open the lid and drink, and I'll take care. I will take care of creating that eternal experience in you. So taste and see that he is good. Here at Campion, we have this card in the front pew. It's called the Connect card. Maybe you're a guest here. Maybe this is your first time here. We give a special gift to those who visit for the first time. Fill out your name, your contact information, your address. We'd love to give you a gift. Maybe you have a question about what was taught today or you have a question about God and you're thinking to yourself, hmm, I want to ask a question. You can ask that question on the connect card in the back. Put your contact information with Christ. Uh, put your contact information on the back. But with Christ, there is true pleasure. And someone here, you may be thinking to yourself, look, I want to begin a relationship with Christ. I want to know how. And we, we here as a pastoral staff, we pray for these connect cards. And if you're wanting to know how to begin a relationship with Christ, pull out your contact information and put beginning a relationship with Jesus. Just check that box in the back of the card. Maybe you have a prayer request. Write that in too. Or maybe someone here is beginning to taste and see that Jesus is good. And you're saying, God, I want to I be baptized. Or I want to start the process so I, I can be baptized soon. Write your contact information. Write down your, uh, mark it here that you want information on baptism. We'd love to come alongside you. Taste and see that the living water is good. And as our musicians, our music team sings this song, if you've been touched by Christ, would you this Christmas season go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ tastes good?
connect card. Feel free to give it to me or one of the elders, the pastors, in the back on your way out. Let's pray together. Father, we've been blessed by the music. We've been blessed by your word. And today, we want to say we want to drink from the fountain of life, the living water today. And so, Father, I pray that today and throughout this Christmas season into the new year, that we would find our greatest satisfaction, pleasure, and delight in drinking the living water. In Jesus' name, amen. joined us today. You're always welcome to join us here in worship. But we want to be available to you. If you have a prayer request, we have a prayer team that are eager 
to be praying for you. If you want to connect with a pastor, ask a question. If you feel you'd like to help support these teachings being online, I want to invite you to contact the number on the screen, 970-667-7403, or the website. We'll put that on the screen for you. You go there, you can contact us, leave a prayer request, connect with us. We'd be honored to hear from you and how we can help you in your spiritual journey. But until next time, know that Jesus is searching for you.